found a new pocket to hide that in, so I'm, I struggle with that more than I would like to admit. As we continue through this focus on mission, we've turned from the where and the how to now the who. And you've already heard who the who is through the children's sermon. We're going to talk about he, me, and them. But before we get to that point, I, I want to talk about one of my favorite characters outside of Jesus. The first one is King David. He was out taking care of the flock. He became king, was chosen to become king. He had many faults that we read about within scripture, and some are elevated in our lives to, to these big faults that he has. That he still receives forgiveness and is king. And to, to me, he is the most emotionally relatable person to myself in scripture. Looking through the Psalms, we see that he's angry or sad or mad at God. But he never loses focus of who God is in his life. And then there's Peter. Peter just always seems to be on this roller coaster of having really big and great highs and then coming down to extreme depths of low. He seems at times to be this strong character, this strong man. And yet at the same time, we see that his flesh is weak. We see at times that he appears to be fearless, stepping out of the boat and onto the water. But in the same breath, we see him to be fearful. And honestly, when I look in the mirror, as I get ready every day, I look in the mirror and I see a man who can be fearless and then when I look at my schedule I look what's up for the day all of a sudden I feel fearful I can look in the mirror and I can see a man that seems to be really strong but I can also see a man who's vulnerable and who can be extremely weak and the reason I like Peter so much is because I think we are all a little like him if we truly examine each of our lives when we look in the mirror every day, I think that we can see Peter in all of us. And we look at that when we look at his strengths and weaknesses. If we begin to look at his weaknesses, we see that he can be headstrong and, and he acts or speaks before he even thinks. In Mark chapter 8, he rebukes Jesus. In Mark chapter 9, he, he wants to build this shelter for Moses and for Elijah, not even focusing on what the point of the transfiguration is for him in that moment. But he can, begins to speak and act without ever thinking. We see that he can be extremely weak in the flesh. When Jesus asked him to pray in the garden, what did he do? He took a nap and fell asleep. When Jesus was about to be arrested, what did he do? Went, took the sword, and chopped off one of the soldier's ears. And then we see after Jesus was arrested, he was asked three questions. And he gave the same three answers. He denied his friend and his Lord. And we see that, in other ways, he's very inconsistent. Like I said earlier, he has these great successes in the faith, but he also has these great crash and burn moments and failure. We see him stepping out of the boat and walking on this water. And then he begins to lose focus and he begins to think he's going to drown and die. But right in front of Jesus, he's inconsistent. He declared this allegiance to his Savior, which was strong and powerful. And then hours later, forgot the allegiance. I don't know about you, but I can speak and act before I think. I can be extremely weak in the flesh, 
and I can be extremely inconsistent. So when I look in the mirror, I see the character Peter. But then we look at his strengths. He was excited and passionate at times. And this excitement and passion may have caused him to act or speak before he thought. For the most part, he was extremely committed. And every time he fell, he got back up. He was so committed that he gave up his career to follow Jesus. And after this instance that we read about today, he is committed to Christ, even up until his death wanting to be crucified upside down because he didn't think he should have a death like his saviors. He was extremely repentant. It says after he denied Jesus in the book of Matthew, it says that he wept bitterly. And in the instance today, we see that he is seeking this forgiveness and that he was reinstated and renewed for his purpose in life. We see that he led a life that was uh, of perseverance, that he was transformed by Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and that he would end up giving his life for Christ. Once again, I can be perseverant. I can be committed. I can be excited and passionate. I think we all are a little like Peter. And in today's text, we see that like Peter, we have failed. But we are also now forgiven. So where do we see some of these failures? The failure that we're talking about today is when he denied Christ. We see that they are in the upper room with Jesus. And shortly after uh, Jesus told the disciples of the betrayal that was to take place, right after Judas is, had, had been sent off, Jesus predicted that this denial was going to happen from Peter's lips in John chapter 13. It says, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter said, Lord, why can't I follow you? I will lay my life down for you. He's committed, he's passionate, he's ready to go through anything for his Savior, even laying his life down for him. He has to be so up here, so high right now, in this moment where he's being strong and not weak, committed. And then Jesus says this, will you really lay down your life for me? I can only imagine the roller coaster of being up here, and having Jesus ask me that question. Chris, will you really lay down your life for me? Peter, will you really lay down your life for me? It's making me think, and, and Peter has to be way down here. And it only gets worse for Peter here. Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Strong and not weak. We see both of those right here. And we see this come out in John chapter 18, verse 17. This lady asked Peter, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? And he replied, I am not. In verse 25, meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. Verse 26 and 27, one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? And again, Peter denied it. And in that moment, a rooster began to crow. Just think about the gravity of this denial, of this betrayal, of the sin that had just occurred here. It hit him so hard that he is, I can just see him in a corner, backed up with nobody around him, weeping, crying bitterly. 
because of the denial that came true. And it wasn't by accident because it was consistent. He didn't just deny him once. He denied him a second and a third time. He was consistent in his answer. It wasn't an act of being brave. It was an act of being a coward. It wasn't an act of saving. It was an act of condemning. And guess what? We are all a little like Peter. We have, whether we've realized it or not, all at one time rejected our Savior. We have, whether we have realized it or not, at one time or another, denied who our Savior is and our association with him. We have all, at some point in time, I imagine, felt the gravity of this denial, this rejection, and this sin of telling people we're not associated with Christ. And if we were to leave the story right here, we would not find ourselves in the text we read today. Even though Peter deserves the judgment for re rejecting and denying Christ, even though you and I deserve the judgment and the punishment for rejecting and denying Christ, Christ does something for us. He offers us forgiveness in this moment. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And it says Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all of all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger and you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said these words, follow me. It's interesting in the, in the original text, if you want to look at the, the different loves that are, be ta that are talked about here, it makes this uh, interaction even more impactful. Because in our English language, this looks like a weird questioning. I think Alyssa would be hurt if I asked her three times, Alyssa, do you love me? It'd be kind of a weird interaction. But Jesus is wanting this deep, profound love answer. And Peter uses a brotherly love for one of the answers. I encourage you, that's not our main focus today, but I'd encourage you if you're interested to go back and look at the original text or, or find us to look at the original text and see that. We see that there's these three questions that Peter was asked when Jesus was arrested and, and on his final day of, do you belong to that guy? And he says, no, he denied Christ there. And, and then we see Jesus ask these three questions of, do you love me? And he answers yes each time. And we see that he is reinstated. We see that he is forgiven. We see like Peter, no matter how many times we fail, when we go to confession and we confess our sins, we are forgiven. God's word gives us Peter's testimony to remind us of the forgiveness that we all need. You see, the truth is we all have rejected God's son, Jesus, in some way or some fashion like Peter. We may have done it, not done it as dramatically like Peter did, but in each of us, there is a sinful heart that wants to distance ourselves from Jesus. We prefer to live our life on our own terms and not on his terms. Like Peter, we've all ignored and rejected Jesus and deserve to be ignored and rejected by him. But Peter's story reminds us 
The only hope of being forgiven of the guilt of sin is to do what Peter does and to run to Jesus. Because Jesus welcomes Peter. Jesus forgives Peter. Jesus saves Peter. And he does that for each of us. He will welcome us. He will forgive us and he will save us from God's judgment. He welcomed Peter into eternal life and he will welcome us into eternal life. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, he said this, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner. I have distanced myself from Christ. I have rejected Christ. I have sinned against Christ. I am a great sinner. But like Peter and like us, we also need to remember not only are we a great sinner, but Christ is a great Savior. And because Christ is a great Savior, like Peter, we can be restored and renewed. In this, all, in this interaction with Christ, he says in verse 15 to Peter, feed my lambs. He says in verse 16, take care of my sheep. And he tells Peter in verse 17 to feed my sheep. Jesus restores Peter to service and for service. To those who follow Jesus Christ in order to be ready for service, we need to have three things. The first one is love. I don't know if you've known this throughout scripture or seen this in scripture, but Jesus Christ is committed to saving failures. Jesus Christ is committed to using failures, to renewing failures. He does that with Peter, he does that with me, and he does that with all of us. What a gracious savior we have. And what a privilege it is that we can call him our savior. We have to realize that the love for God and the love for others has to be a driving force in our restoration and in our renewal for ministry. Church tradition has it that Peter was crucified upside down for his faith. He felt unworthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. Now it's clear in verse 18 that Peter did not want to go through that, so why did he? Why did he just not renounce Jesus and save himself and live out his retirement in the suburbs? Why didn't he just abandon the sheep that Jesus Christ had put him in charge of? It was simply because he loved Christ, because Christ was everything to Peter. He had come to know the greater sacrifice that Jesus made for him. He had experienced Jesus' amazing forgiveness of his guilt and shame, and he knew that while his executors might take his earthly life, that Jesus would faithfully raise him up for eternity. And not just him, but all those who God has called to mission. And that's the view of Jesus we desperately need. That the love of Jesus is what will keep us going in our service. The second thing we need is to know where our identity lies. Jesus clearly lays it out for Peter and for us that our identity should be only in him and only in following him. And in verse 19, he said to Peter, follow me. The more we will be willing to direct people away from putting their hope in us and back into Jesus, is to remember that Jesus tells Peter that they are his sheep and not Peter's sheep. Here it's not Pastor Lewis's sheep or, or Pastor Jonathan's sheep or, or Pastor Tyler's sheep or, or Pastor Chris's sheep. It's the sheep of Jesus Christ. He is the one we ought to be following. Third thing is to have focus. Peter once again shows us how frail he is in us thinking in his flesh and his role. In verse 20, after Christ had done this interaction of loving and forgiving, and as he says, follow me, Peter loses it right here. He's on this top of the roller coaster again, and he's about to go down. Because all of a sudden he sees the disciple whom John loved, or who Jesus loved off to the side, and he says, well, what about him? What's his mission going to be? How is he going to die? What, what's going to go on with him? Within seconds, he loses focus. And I've never seen this more clearly than I do in my own daughter. 
We change her diaper, and after we get done changing her diaper, we tell her to go put it in the trash. And maybe one or two times out of every 10 times does she make a direct line from where we changed her diaper to the trash can. But what often happens is she takes her diaper, she takes a couple steps, she drops it, and she picks up the cocoa melon toys. Scarlet, take it to the trash. She puts her cocoa melon toys down, picks up her diaper, she walks over to the Blue's Clues toys. Scarlet, take it to the trash. She puts that down, and then she goes, takes a few more steps, goes and gets Peppa Pig. And then finally, after the third or fourth time, she remembers that her goal, her mission, her purpose right now is to take that diaper and to put it in the trash can. And as I look at her and how easily she loses her focus, I look once again at my life and I see how easily I lose focus. And then once again, I realize I'm a lot like Peter. It's easy for us to focus on Uh, Focus not on what our calling, our objective, or our goal is, but instead think of what others are doing and we become jealous, hateful, or becomes crippling to the ministry we're leading. We must focus on what God has called us as individuals to do and only look to him and keep our focus on him. So you want to know who the mission, uh, the who of mission, it comes down to this. He, me, them. That's the who of mission. It also aligns with our mission statement. He, to be gathered in his word, not my word, to receive forgiveness from him, to be led by him, to get our calling from him. Me, to be transformed by the word. The Holy Spirit will do this radical transformation within my life and within your life, and then them, to share the word. Wherever we go, being willing and open to follow that calling from God and to share the love and the word of God with others. So here's where we end with our mission statement. The mission of Lutheran Church of the Master is this, to gather in the word, to be transformed by the word, and to share the word. And it's in his name we pray, amen.